Well, Tim Ashoff is with us from uh, Crete and Schaefer. And uh, Tim, good morning, man. It's good to have you back with us. Always great talking with you. Great to be here. Um, you know, I kind of gave a, a, a kind of a stumbling inter, uh, introduction to our discussion here this morning. But, you know, when you say five years out, all of a sudden we hit what sounds like a landmark, you know, 2020. And uh, it has a ring to it. And it has a um, almost a futuristic aspect to it, doesn't it? It does. And it's so amazing because, you know, it just seems like yesterday we were talking about, you know, turning over into the new millennium and, and the year 2000 and, and, you know, but when you look forward, you think, well, five years is a long time away, but it, it really goes fast. It really does. Five years from now, we'll be in a, probably a very hot summer in 2020, looking back with fondness at the good old days. <laughs> right. <laughs> Boy, 2015, man, that was a great year. Um <laughs> But let's take a look at the trucking industry uh, in in five years. You know, uh, everything's trending now. You know, how is that trending? What are the trends? That's the new buzzword. Um, The middle class uh, is in trouble here in this country, but we see it emerging in uh, other nations, and we are going to see um, consumption up. We all know that here. In fact, I think that there we... um, the numbers that we look at in terms of uh, driver shortage, the numbers we look at in terms of uh, ports and uh, infrastructure all point to an incredible increase in commodity movement and shipping volumes here in this country uh, and, and around the world because a lot of that stuff's going to be coming here and leaving here for those areas. Um, what does it look like uh, to the folks that kind of have the crystal ball? Well, you know, I think we are, as, as the other kind of buzzword is, you know, becoming the global economy, and I think that that is going to continue. And, you know, we are, you know, we talk about what, what is the U.S. Uh, good at and what do we do, and sometimes we overlook we are a great food supplier to the world, and that growing middle class uh, across the world um, also means a growing demand for, you know, higher level, higher quality of, of foods, and so I think that will be a great component of that uh, growth for the U.S. over the next four or five years. But certainly, you know, the other products that we make will be intermixed in that global economy. And then certainly we are also, as as we all know, we are, you know, huge importers of of goods from across the world. So that mix of of in and out, um, we see just continuing to grow and that growth in middle class you know, obviously, we like to see that here in the United States and our middle class to be strong, but certainly in other countries uh, is going to help the United States as well. Indeed. In fact, uh, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on made in USA here in the country, but the made in USA label or, as you would point out, grown in the USA still has a great, great deal of impact and uh, significance around the world, does it not? It does. It's interesting. You know, I was just talking actually to one of our customers uh, yesterday, and you know, we one of the things we haul is, is some protein, so we haul some beef, and and you know, the, the U.S. market for beef, I think, as many know, has been down a little bit. The prices are up, and there had been some you know drought impacts over the last couple of years and things. But they're talking about how strong their exports are to certain countries just because of that demand for that you know U.S. beef, and uh, you know that's always good to hear. And, you know, obviously see that continuing if we can keep that good quality of product we have for that made or grown in the USA, as you say. One of the things, and, and all of those commodities, whether they be materials, uh, material products or, or food or uh, even um, animals, if you will, uh, they're not on the coast to begin with. They're pretty much in the heartland of the country, in the middle of the country. Uh, where we have the farms, where we have the ranches uh, for cattle and, and whatnot. So getting it from the from Kansas to L.A. or from uh, Nebraska to um, New York for shipments uh, to, uh, say, Europe on one side, Asia on the other, uh, that is a, a going to become a, a bigger and bigger challenge for us as demand around the world continues to grow for our stuff. That's right, and I think that you know what that means for the overall market over the next five years is there will be a continued increase in demand for 
you know, good quality carriers and good quality drivers. And so I think, uh, you know, that the future is bright in that regard for the, the trucking industry. You know, there's different, a lot of different modes that that freight can go on, as, as we all know, but certainly uh, any of those refrigerated products on. And one of the things we are seeing is even an increased demand in, in fresh product to be exported, which you've got to move that fairly quickly, not only across land here in the U.S., but then across, um, you know, the ocean to get to those continents. So, that that demand for timely service will continue and certainly be good for the the truckload industry and I think particularly the refrigerated industry. One of the things that uh, we hear quite, a, you know, the, the crumbling into infrastructure. We, we want to go with cliches and buzzwords, so we might as well sure. keep up, keep the list going here. So, the crumbling infrastructure of uh, Governor Graves heading up a ATA testified before the uh, House of uh, Ways and Means Committee yesterday. I read through uh, some of his comments earlier on the program this morning, and um, we're. we're the emphasis is on on the here and now in terms of uh, the bridges and the highways and the potholes and and you know lane constrictions and and congestion but if you take uh, if you pull back to the 30,000 foot view uh, our middle country infrastructure uh, is absolutely critical to the economic growth of our economy in terms of exports and even imports for that matter but let's let's go with exports uh, because that's kind of where we we, you and i are trending in this conversation um does congress there, there doesn't seem to be very much discussion about that at least not that i've heard within congress itself it seems about the here and now immediacy of falling bridges and crumbling roads but they're not looking forward uh, to the potential of the benefits of uh, more, uh, more better infrastructure uh, like the trucking industry has. I mean, the industry itself is looking forward to the future with big numbers and big, big picture ideas. But the government doesn't seem to be doing that. Or am I, am I wrong there? Do they get that? Do they understand what five years can mean here? I, I think you're uh, absolutely right, and you know I think we're we're at this uh, I think maybe unfortunate point in how our our government is operating. Where I think if you talk to the lawmakers individually um, and talk to them about that, they see that, but then they get caught up. I'll call it in that Washington whirlwind of trying to to get something done, and it becomes more of well, what are you doing for me today, uh, and what what can I spend or not spend today um, mentality, and and somehow that gets that gets lost in that conversation from the one-on-one conversation to the broader uh, lawmaking body, and and that's that's a challenge to get through. And I think what would be really helpful, and and you know certainly all of all of the listeners on this program know better than anyone that we need to have that we need to have that immediacy because we do have those crumbling bridges and some congestion and other things where we need that immediate spending. But certainly we need that longer-term spending to keep that advantage we've had as a as a country i mean the the you know, building of the interstate system um you know 50 60 years ago now was you know hugely impactful on our economy and and doing just what you said and it enable us to move our goods across the country not only for our own consumption but then for export and if we don't keep that strong infrastructure um it will impact our ability to to be a a strong supplier of of the world's goods and you know world leader in that way. One of the things uh, I'm going to kind of silently uh, change gears. Maybe it's a good automated transmission. Um, but um, Tim, but we um, we're talking about um, new concepts for trucks, uh, and part of the reason that we need to look at new truck concepts is the fact that it's just more and more difficult to get into urban areas. But the problem with but kind of in a, in a sense exacerbating uh, exacerbating that problem is the fact that we are seeing i think tim I, I read and i may be wrong but the largest and this is worldwide uh speaking of global economy there is the the largest migration in in human history is taking place right now as we speak and it's people moving from the country to the city it's here in the United States. It's it's worldwide. This is changing the dynamic and parameter of the attitudes and concepts about what transportation means 
and how many people are affected. Like you got I-70 going across Missouri. They have actually offered up their interstate for experimentation from any comers from around the world or maybe even the universe to help figure out how to get goods and people moving across that interstate in in that middle country state. Um, But people are, are flocking to cities which means trucks now need to flock to cities, but it can't be the same truck that used to was, I guess you might say, right? Well, you know, that's certainly, uh, we certainly see that here, right, even in, in Nebraska, as we see that migration yeah. towards the cities here from, from, you know, we're an agricultural state, but from our farmlands, farming has become much more efficient, so it's a natural piece of that as well. But you're right, and I think we've seen that change taking place in the uh, overall freight network, as we have seen. I think more distribution centers in the last, really starting about five years ago, be set up across the countries right on the outside of those, you know, major metropolitan areas because, um, you know, the, the, the truckloads going right into some of those cities isn't as easy. And part of that has come with the change of the hours of service rules, too, where we used to drive into those big cities at night and with that continuous clock and that 10-hour break, uh, it's harder for drivers to shift from day to night and those types of things. So we're 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 taking our our freight and then delivering it to the big distribution city centers uh, right outside of those major cities. And then yeah, the type of equipment that's going into those cities um, is different. Typically, going to be you know I'll call it more agile, getting into those city deliveries during the day or otherwise. So we do see a little bit of of trend in that regard, but you know still going to be a strong core uh, of need for the over-the-road drivers like we have in in that 53-foot trailers and the sleeper trucks uh, taking it from the the good centers to those big distribution centers. I think, you know, I think you just pointed out uh, maybe a, a little obliquely here that going back to what I said to kind of open uh, this this area of our discussion, uh, everybody's moving to the cities, and so trucks are going to have to change in operations. But um, you're right. You know, uh, we tend to forget the the step we just went through to get to the step that we're going to and the step that we are leading towards. We tend to forget that you just don't stop that operation, the, the long haul operation, the mm-hmm. truckload operation, just because things are changing in the cities. So there's a real balance for, for you guys. There is, and we have to we have to be agile too, and understand what our customers' needs are ultimately, and that's something we have done. And in fact, uh, you know, over the last two years, we've developed um, different fleets. Uh, we have a I'll call it a more of a day cab metro fleet in the Dallas market, um, we, in the kind of the heartland there, in that uh, Indianapolis Ohio range. We have um, some fleets now that essentially run just within that area, and drivers are paid by the day, and we're doing more of those deliveries um, that are into those populate, populated areas from some of those distribution centers and in the that part of the country, manufacturing centers that are shorter length of haul right into the customer, and, um, you know, we have to look at some things differently. We're doing that up in the Northeast as well, and, uh, you know, we have to adapt to that, and we have to have that right balance of certainly having that core of over-the-road drivers that has been our foundation at you know both Crete and Schaefer for 50 plus years but then adapt to you know what what is changing and what will change over the next five years. Tim Ashoff is with us. Tim is president of Schaefer and chief operating officer of Crete. Tim um, I, I know that one of the things that you will emphasize everywhere every possible way and everywhere you can is the driver. Uh, your emphasis is about the driver. And in my observation, going back to the early 70s here on the radio and kind of walking through all of these decades with everybody, um, I I have said that it seems to me the late 80s is kind of where we saw a shift uh, in terms of the desire of the truck driver to just not be gone all the time. Oh, you know, uh, we we used to have that old joke, and I know you you cringe when you hear this sort of thing, but you remember the old Uncle Daddy days, right? You know, it's like uh, I remember a, a, a fellow saying that his his son said, "Dad, you've been gone so long, I forgot what you look like." 
folks didn't want to do that much anymore. I mean, you still have the exceptions, of course. You're still going to have a lot of folks that still love the freedom of the road, still want to see the country, still want to do long haul. There's no question about that. But the dynamic in terms of uh, driver needs and wants has changed more to uh, home life. And I saw that change start to I saw that battleship start to turn or maybe aircraft carriers start to turn very slowly in the 80s. Are we getting to the culmination of this dynamic shift in terms of driver um, expectations? I think we are. And I think it's, you know, home life, as you mentioned, is is so important um, to everyone and certainly understandably why. And again, that's the reason why I think many companies like we have have developed more options for drivers um, to to be able to be home more often. And, you know, the, the unfortunate kind of challenge of, with that for, for many folks is, is that typically, you, you know, if you if you want more of something, you have to give, give up something else. And some of that is, you know, you're home more often. Uh, there's generally an impact on, okay, well, what are the overall miles you're running then? And so what's your overall pay going to be? So getting that right mix, and we work hard at that to make sure that, Yes, we want to we want to provide that balance of, of home time and home time options, but certainly still have our drivers make um, a good pay, and certainly it's something we've, as you said, focused on the drivers and and here at Crete and Schaefer, and you know, being one of the top paying companies is always important to us. So we have to look at that and and how does that even play out on those. Um, for those drivers that want to be home more often. So we work hard in balancing in that and make sure that they get the right pay. But then along with that is what do we need to do to make them um, even have more attachment to home, I'll call it. And certainly, as I know you've talked uh, many, many times on this program about technology providing that. Um, but, it's, you know, it's one thing for, for drivers to have the technology in their phones or otherwise and others to be able to use it. So how do we you know, set up our trucks with the right power sources and other things for them? So we have to look at it holistically, um, not only just being able to get drivers home when they want to be home and on the right cycle, but then, you know, how can we keep them uh, connected with home while they're out on the road and give them that opportunity? It's amazing how one guy writing one story for one newspaper can peg a headline, and that headline, and essentially the story, will be repeated uh, in newspapers and then possibly picked up by uh, electronic media throughout the country. Got a headline here that's been bouncing around the country, and you might have seen this. Paying truckers by mile isn't fair or safe. And um, it was an article that came out of the uh, Los Angeles Times originally, if I'm not mistaken, which kind of leads leads us to uh, another very important aspect of what we're talking about here, and that is how drivers get paid. Um, you guys pay on practical miles, and I know a lot of folks really like that. Uh, kind of talk about that in terms of practical hub and then the good old-fashioned mover's guide. Sure. Yeah, you know, we do think, um, you know, a driver being able to make a good living does impact safety. And so that is, you know, safety is very important to us. And so we make sure our drivers are able to make a good living. And, you know, there are obviously, the, as the article points out, there's different methods of getting to that. One of the things we think um, is very important under, I'll call it the, the current system today of the common way of paying, paying by the mile, um, is to make sure we're paying them for the miles that they run. And that's why, you know, we were probably one of the first uh, larger companies, particularly, to move to paying our drivers by practical route miles. And and just kind of a little refresher on that. Those are, you know, that's that practical route is the route um, based upon the, the distance between the downtown post office of both locations, the pickup location and the receiving location. But then it looks at the route along the way that is a practical truck route. So not taking those, you know, back back road, two lane highways that a truck could go on, but probably not the safest, but would be the shortest. And so what we find is, you know, that really does pay our drivers for the miles they are running. And I think that gives them peace of mind and knowing that they're they're getting paid for the, the miles they turn. You know, many, I think, companies uh, and was the industry norm, and I think in many ways still is, pay on that household movers guide, which is that shortest distance from one city to the next using, you know, the city limits uh, on the outer edge. And we have seen that uh, throughout the years, that difference can be about 4 to 5% difference in pay between that 
household movers guide um, that others and the industry is typically used to the practical route miles. So, you know, drivers do need to be paid fairly for what they do, and and uh, I'm not certain that paying them by the hour is a benefit in that. You know, we're we're still we're still good old America, and, and the American way is, uh, you know, you do more, you work harder, you should get more, and that's certainly uh, getting paid by the mile is a good way to uh, reward drivers that that do work hard and do get uh, their job done, and and are proud of that. Hey, you know what? We just got about a minute left, Tim, and I can't uh, let you get away without talking about the uh, five new Patriot fleet trucks uh, coming out the new uh, Freightliners. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, we've had uh, Patriot Fleet here at Crete and Schaefer for a number of years, proud to have been involved with that. And we're expanding that program now to our Hunt Transportation uh, Company. That's our uh, open deck uh, division here on the Crete Carrier family of companies and adding five new Patriot trucks to that fleet here starting on July 1st. So, you know, it's for, we just had Flag Day and we just have Fourth of July coming up and, and you know, one of the things we're so proud of uh, at Creek Carrier and Schaefer and Hunt is the number of, of veterans we have. We have over 30% of our drivers are veterans, and it's a great way to honor them and certainly all drivers out there that are veterans. So we thank you for everything you've done for our country and for our freedom to roam the roads. Well, well Tim, it's an honor having you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Tim Ashoff, president of Schaefer, chief operating officer at Crete. And, uh, gee, I guess we won't speak. So uh, happy Independence Day to you and all. Same to you. Thank you.